It is a brand new Monday edition of Flyers Daily for December 11th, 2023. Yeah, December already and creeping our way two weeks now from Christmas. Happy Hanukkah and happy holidays to everybody as we get into the season. And Flyers Daily presented by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. And of course, we've got the Penn Medicine assist as well. Flyers piled up seven assists in the game uh, the other night. The win and uh, that means 210 pounds of food donated to local communities in need as part of the Flyers and Penn Medicine uh, community assist. Uh, joining us in this episode, as he does every Monday, it is uh, Bill Meltzer from PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. And boy, it's been quite the week of hockey, Bill. And dare I say, even to this point here on December 11th, it's been quite the season so far for the Flyers. You know, uh, the game, the game in Colorado was just a, I mean, just just it was just flat out fun. I mean, it was a action packed. Um, you know, we we're just a I know total team effort is a cliche, but it was. It was a total team effort up and down that lineup. And you know, the Flyers had to really work their tails off for this win. And it was just it was just satisfying. I mean, you know, I thought back, you know, a year ago at this time, when I mean, the Flyers split two games with Colorado. They won one in Philly, which was a game where McKinnon got hurt. And they gave they gave them a, a tough game um in Denver. Ultimately lost it. There was a game where, where York had a goal in the first period. Flyers made a, made a run of them in the third, but they they lost by one. They lost three to two. But it was, but it was a good game. But you know, uh, I thought about this win compared to when the Flyers did manage a win against Colorado a year ago, and I have to tell you, this felt different. I guess because of where the Flyers are in the standings. Uh, I guess because McKinnon played in this one. McKinnon left the other one with an injury, but. You know, the Flyers in, in some stretches of that game kind of had to take Colorado's best shot because Colorado gave them, you know, it was it was a tough hockey game. And, and to, to pull away, ultimately, get, get clutch offense, get good goaltending, your veterans stepped up, uh, some of the young guys who, you know, who were maybe a little bit inconsistent this year all stepped up in this game. It was really, really nice to see. It was a game where kind of everything came together. And I, I mean, I, I felt psyched after the game. Actually, it was it was it was a nice feeling, honestly. Yeah, it's it's really putting me putting a lot of people to the test here because you know we didn't expect this, and it, it is December 11th, and the team is sitting in the second spot of the Metro Division right now. Uh, they are five points back of the Rangers. They played two more games than the Rangers. They have 32 points. Rangers have 37, but they're one up on the Islanders. Islanders have a game in hand. In all fairness. Uh, they're uh, three points up on the Caps, who they'll see on Thursday. And then you look at the Devils, they're, they're three points up on the Devils as well. They have some games in hand on a couple of these teams, but we didn't see this coming, Bill. And, you know, the, the thing that I think is interesting is they had a little dip, but they pulled the nose up. Yeah. And they haven't been perfect since they pulled the nose up. But, they're, you know, there's some really quality wins in there when you look at the one nothing win over the Islanders. You look at, you know, the overtime loss against New Jersey, I think, was a a harbinger of what was to come in the two extra session games against Pittsburgh. You, you win a home and home on both ends with extra time and a shootout in one of them. And then you go to Arizona on the road who had won five straight. And that was, they really, I thought it was a low event game, but that's what it dictated. You walked out of there with a, a rather easy win. And then you go to Colorado, going into the third period, you're up by a goal and you come out of the game and you win by three and don't give anything up. Not to mention, I thought that Carter was shaky in that first period in that game and he settled in. It's staggering yeah. what they're doing on the road. No, no, oh, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, I, it, it's funny, I, and I think it, I think it uh, speaks a little bit to the perspective changing a little bit because to Arizona, and Arizona had won five in a row, and Ingram was playing. He was the NHL Player of the Week. He had two shots in his previous five games. You know, minuscule goes against outrageous save percent. Really solved them, solved them pretty well um, in that game. Uh, you know, the team that came in, I think number five on the power play in Arizona, and not only did the Flyers once again kill off three penalties, they scored yet another shorthanded goal. Um, amazing. You know, and, and once you and once they kind of had control in the third period, the lead never really felt threatened. So maybe it wasn't a high event game. You have to play the game that's in front of you, but I think it was it was impressive nevertheless, and. Um, and going to Colorado, I mean, there were there were all kinds of you know all kinds of moments where the game could have could have gone. Even you go back to the first shift of the game, right? The, the Flyers were hemmed in right off the bat, and and if Colorado scores right off the bat, 
who who knows what happens from there. And actually, uh, I mean, Tyson Forster made a really good defensive play. And that kind of, it set a tone. So many guys contributed in little and big ways in that game. And, uh, I mean, it was really, it was it was really one of the most satisfying wins I remember in a while, even, even more than sweeping the, the home and home of Pittsburgh, just because Colorado was one of the, one of the toughest teams to beat on their home ice. Yeah. They are two years removed from the cup. They're definitely still a contender. And it wasn't like they played a dog of a game. They, they gave the flyers all they could handle. So, you know, uh, you, you can't get too you know too up or down over one game, a win or a loss. But here the Flyers are having won four in a row, points in five in a row. Um, you know, it's important to finish up the right way when they go to Nashville. And then you said, and then they're playing another divisional game against Washington. Here we are. It's getting in, you know, getting to in mid December now, and uh, the Flyers are right in this thing. I mean. You know, if the, if the season ended today, they'd be a home ice team, as a matter of fact. So <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's almost crazy to even think. And, you know, I, I, I'm i sitting here trying to not change expectations go, yeah. that I had going into the year, but um, it's getting more difficult by the day. You know, the crazy thing about it, Bill, is this team has played 10 different defensemen this season. Yes. We're 27 games in. I mean, they've played... Sanheim, York, Walker, Sealer, Zamula, Stahl, Ristolainen, and Emil Andre played four games. Victor Metti played a game. Louis Belpedio played 12, yeah. and they still sit here. I mean, when you talk about 10 defensemen already, a third into the season, that's an enormous number. It, it is quite a high number, and they've had injuries. You know, uh, Ristolainen missed the first 20 games of the season, and Stahl, and Stahl missed a month. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's – I, I'm why if I had to pick my biggest surprise this season so far, it's how well the blue line has come together. Yeah, they're much better than last year, Billy. Oh, no, no, no question, no question. And, uh, you know, I guess you can owe it to uh, several things. I mean, because because I think that Sealer is still the same player he was a year ago, which is a good thing. I mean, yeah, except he's playing more minutes and mm-hmm. uh, tougher matchups, but doing the same things. But I, I think the three things you can owe it to are that I mean Sanheim, who was uh, Sanheim was tremendous in that Colorado game, best um, game of the year. I thought. So that I, thought so yep. I thought so too. Yeah, I thought so too. Just just his decisiveness with the puck. Yeah. Um. You know, it, it, through all three zones, I thought that was a fantastic game. And, and remember, Travis has been struggling for a few weeks, so yep. it, it was really just a big, you know, just fantastic to see that. Uh, it's the continued growth of Cam York that's been. Great to see, and I don't think you can overestimate what Sean Walker has been for the team too, as as their number three guy. Um, you know, and, and everything's kind of come together around that. The, the third pairing, I think, they're still kind of uh, working out how that's how that's going to look on a regular basis. But um, yeah, but I but I think if if you know if I had to something that I did not see coming, I, I you know coming into the season, my biggest concern was how the blue line was going to come together. And uh, so far, they've they've more than answered the bell. So that's been really, really nice to see. Bill, I said on yesterday's pod that I didn't see any way, shape, or form that we could get this kind of play from Travis Sanheim. You know, in my best prognostications, you know, I, I always thought he'd be, you know, a big framed guy that was a finesse player uh, that yeah. wouldn't have the element of power into his game. And I'm not saying... Um, that he's going out there and putting guys through the boards or hitting open ice hit. That's not his game. Um, but the power that he's added to his game, along with, with the word you just used, that decisiveness, um, this has eclipsed my wildest dreams of what he could be as an NHL player. Um, I, I don't know why it's happened. Um, I think that it's a you know, I think it's the culmination of a bunch of things, including the fact that he was almost traded. Um, yeah. and I think also, you know. You got to give the coaching staff some credit here, too, because, uh, you know, they push the players to break down barriers that they maybe think they have in their game to make them realize they can do more. And whatever it is with Travis Sanheim, th- he's broken down a barrier that I didn't see that he could get break down and get through because the physicality and the way, he, like the way he drives the net on the, the assistant goal <laughs> Araby ends up getting is something that I would have, yeah, I, I see the guy get up the ice and join the rush or lead the rush. But never go to the net like that. Like, and he's done it on a number of occasions this year. Oh yeah, yeah. Just his entry in the zone. I mean, it was uh, just that was a that that was just tremendous. The way that he, you know, I mean, he could always join the play. 
Yep. But he's not often the guy who brings it in and, and takes it to the net. That that uh, I didn't really know he had in him. Um, you know, and and um, moving moving over to the other side, moving to the right side has been agreeable to him too. And it can be it can be a hard thing for for a defenseman to play in his offside. Now Travis has played right defense before, played some junior hockey, played some in the NHL, but you know, in your own zone, whether the pucks are coming around the wall. Or you're, or you see, you're playing on your backhand, or you're exposing the puck over the middle, which is always a risk in that too. And not, not everybody feels comfortable playing on their, playing on their offside. And he hadn't done too much of it in, in the last few years. And I mean, the comfort level he's had with it that that surprised me too, just how instantly he he uh, readapted to doing that. Um, and it, it's helped. That's helped Cam York too. Yeah, it has. And the way that Cam York has really tightened his defending and we're starting to see elements of that, the offensive elements of his game as well. Yeah. Um, real quick, Bill, before we get to the Twitter questions on Ask Billy, um, you know, you mentioned Sean Walker. I'm going to mention Sean Couturier as well. And I bring it up a lot, did a lot when I was doing sports talk radio about slotting in sports. When guys are in the lineup that are supposed to be top line guys and it just slots everybody else right. Like the year, you know, the year the Flyers had Sean Couturier, Claude Giroux, uh, Scott Lawton taking third line faceoffs. They were a great faceoff team, but when yeah. Lawton had to go up and be the top guy, he wasn't as successful because they were slotted. Yeah. And is it as simple as this balance coming from the fact that you got a Sean Couturier back and he has slotted this forward group so much differently and so much to the Flyers' benefit that we're seeing them be able to put the puck in the net with regularity like this because they still don't have the super skilled weapon guys and highly skilled players that are going to go out there, you know, like a McDavid or like a Matthews and Marner and guys all over the league. They don't have that guy, but yeah. they're scoring goals. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the flyers will go through some stretches again where, where mm -hmm. goals are hard to come by. I think that's going to, you know, it's going to ebb and flow. It, it always ebbs and flows, but I mean, I, I think part of the flyers when the flyers hit that little stretch in November where, or wins were a little hard to come by for a while. They were getting, you know, they they were in games, but they they were losing a lot of one goal games. Um, you know, I I think in that point they were just lacking a like you you could you could see that that lack of that that really top end goal scorer. But um, you know, but they're you know, I mean, it, it's been it's been huge seeing uh, Tyson Forster gain some confidence, and, and he's he's scoring some goals now. Um, you know, and when you talk about slotting with Gatorie, and it, it's not just on the offensive side, yeah, you know, because your defensive matchups slot better that way too. And, um, I, I think that I, I can't, I don't think you can overstate how much having Gatorie back in the lineup has meant. Um, you know, I, I and it's something that, that I'm, I'm going to touch on in a little bit here. Um, I hope it's something that, uh, you know, I'm hoping all these 20 minute nights don't add up on them as yeah, he gets back half of the schedule. Yeah, I thought like you know after an initial burst going into the season, I thought he hit a little bit of a wall. I yeah. think he maybe was a little bit banged up because they held him out of a couple practices. Yeah, um, but he seems to have kicked back into that that Sean Couturier gear again, and that's something that if that is sustainable, uh, to use a word which you'll hear again, then uh, um, th that would obviously be. A, a huge it's like probably the biggest addition you could make to this team yeah. let's get to the ask billy questions because I, I put out this tweet bill and i said um i said i know some flyer fans are conflicted about the team playing very well um so now's a great time for an ask billy episode on flyers daily and uh said that, you know drop your questions here and I, I got a lot of kind of pushback on that and people saying i was never conflicted and i think there's a little bit of revisionist history there at all for some yeah. Because a lot of people did not want them to have success in the standings to pick up at the front. But I think some of them are also finding it very easy to root for this team and get caught up in what we're seeing. And let me give you the first one here from Dan Knightley. He says, all the young players playing well and older players living up to their potential. Isn't this what we want? And I think Dan sums it up really yeah. succinctly because the young players are really carrying their load. And when you need the older players, they're carrying their load as well. But when you need them to really grab a game like that game on Monday against Pittsburgh, they do exactly that. No, no oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
that game against Colorado, which reminded me a lot of how you'd manage a playoff game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because the Flyers were going for long stretches of that game. They were almost alternating Couturier and Lawton on every other shift. Um, you know, like like you would like you wouldn't a playoff game. It was a you know the Flyers kind of treated it almost like like a must win kind of a game. Uh, now, mind you, they're they were playing they're playing a center short, um, but they you know to, to have in those situations the um, such as the home and home with Pittsburgh and, and, and this game uh, in Colorado, you really you know you need a your depth, but you also need the the veteran guys who've been in these kind of games before, and they they're your tone setters, and uh, you know from. From Konechny to Couturier to, um, uh, you know, to to Lawton. And even, you know, and, and I thought that although he still, he still was able to put one in the net and had a couple of really good chances, I, I thought actually that was Cam Atkinson's best game in a while. Um, you want to see him build on that some more. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the biggest issues sometimes with young players, um, and, and I think this is his his – been a fair criticism of some of the flyers under under 25 guys when things are going well for the team they can jump right in and it clicks for them too and and they can contribute it's when nothing's going your way and who's going to turn the tide in the game that's where you a learn a lot about uh your personnel in general but also your young guys because it's kind of easy to play like everybody else is playing sometimes um you know, I, I thought there were some stretches in this game where, you know, things were turning a little bit against the Flyers. You know, I mean, they, they, they had runs made of them, and um, they needed somebody to provide some equilibrium. I, I thought uh, I thought Bobby Brink did that, for example. Yeah. Um, really, really, that whole line, Tippett, Tippett Frost, and, and Brink had some really good shifts where they started creating some chances and pushing back. And, and it's you know that's what you want to see. You want to see a variety of players able to step up in those situations. And you know it's it's one game, uh, a great game, but but a game you want to you know, but it, it can be a building block. That that's the biggest thing I want, I want to see taken away from that game that the Flyers can build off of that. So I, I think you hit the nail on the head. You have your you know, your veterans who help set the tone, but you also have the young guys stepping up too. That's exactly what you want. That that's how you build. Yeah, it really is. And you know those younger players, I think in that game, like a game against Pittsburgh, I thought Couturier really grabbed that game. And I love the quote that Travis Konechny said about Couturier. You know, I'll get back on the bench sometimes if I do something dumb, and he'll give me that look, and I know that look. And boy, boy Bill, do you? I mean, I hear a lot of the the verbiage coming out of the locker room, whether that's Travis Konechny in particular, but um, guys like Carter Hart um, talking about how together this group is. Yeah, there may be a little bit of nobody uh, th- believed in us. They all thought, you know teams always do that in sports. Yeah. The Eagles did that and wrote it to a, a Super Bowl win, right? <laughs> but yeah. um, I hear a lot of leadership coming out of that locker room from across the different age demographics. And I, you really get a sense that that locker room is now where John Tortorella wanted it to go. And that was job number one for him. Yeah. And and he, he made no bones about that either. Last yeah. year, after he may have season. insulted a few people along the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I and you know, I, I think that that uh, you know, I, I mean, he's never, never <laughs> worried. He's never worried about if some some feathers get ruffled. That that's one thing with Torts. He that's never, never front of mind for Torts. But um, but yeah, I mean, he, he he'll talk a lot about how the number one difference he sees with the team is the room. Yeah, and. You know, some of it is that, uh, you know, guys are pushing each other in a positive way. So you have nobody pointing fingers. You don't have anybody sulking. Um, and that, that, I mean, that, that that's so big in a team over the course of a year. And I remember saying before the season, you know, everybody gets along before the season starts. And then when you, then when the adversity hits is, is how you see, well, the Flyers have had adversity. They're going to have adversity again. But I, but I do think there's the character in the room that they can weather the storm when the adversity does hit. Yeah, to me, it's really easy to have a good room until the shit hits the fan. Precisely. But when that hits the fan, th- then you find out what kind of room you really have. And just like the maturity of a guy like Konechny, it, I mean, watching this unfold from, you know, as he's gone through his professional arc of development and reestablishing himself 
Uh, he's playing his best hockey of his career. He's got five multi-point or multi-goal games this season, and he's just been a catalyst for the team. And I think the big another part of his catalyst that he's providing is just this leadership from a younger demographic on the roster. And Carter Hart, I, I've said this quite a bit, Bill, that you know I I look at rebuilds and I always say for some teams it's really hard to judge where they are in a rebuild and where they're going. Yeah. Um, if you don't have goaltending, and I think that's a lot of times why some rebuilds get stalled because you can't, it's hard to develop as a player. If you, every time you make a mistake, it's a goal and it's a loss, yeah. but if you are a team that can get goaltending and be in tight games and win some of them, I think the arc of development for individual players and as a group is much, has a much greater chance of success. Where would the, I mean, this hasn't been a year where they just goalie in teams night in and night out. They've been, you know, scoring some goals and timely situational hockey. But I mean, the stability that they've gotten on that back end from Carter, from stem to stern this year, yeah. and then from Sam Harrison after the first three starts has been a resounding difference. And I just, I don't know how you can judge any of this without goaltending. I, I think uh, I think that's exactly right. And then and why when people said, well, why do you need a good goalie if you're not a cup contender? Well, you need, you need a good goalie because you, you need that. If you're going to build and have an identity, if if every every game you're constantly worried, every time the puck goes in your own end of the ice, you're afraid to make mistakes. You know, you're um, if you do let in a bad one, you know, and every it happens to all goalies and all teams, right? But it doesn't deflate you. Because you know, you know the next save will be made. Um, even if even if you're not a, a cup contender, it does so much to make to make the team as a better whole. I mean, teams, team defense, even even the offensive side, but especially team D and goaltending, you can't separate the two. One will either help lift the other, um, and they they rise together, or one will drag the other down with it, and then every, you know everything goes to hell. So. Yeah, and. I mean, just players as, you know, do you think that Owen Tipp is going to try the things he tried last year if he didn't have good goaltending? If, you know, he's going to try some of those spin moves and some of the things that he did or Morgan Frost, it doesn't do Frost any good to develop at the NHL level or Bobby Brink or Joel Farabee yeah. if they can't take risk and know that they can be bailed out because eventually it's human nature. If it, if you keep taking risks and it keeps ending up in the back of your net and costing you games, you're going to stop doing it. No matter how much you say, just keep pushing. It's just not going to happen. Uh, let's get to our next Ask Billy question. I'm going to combine these two. Nick Hankins, he says, if this season is a playoff season, how does this adjust the rebuild process? And we'll combine it with Bill H's. He says, I'm definitely for the rebuild, but not a teardown tank. Ha happy to see them playing well. The question, though, is do you trade away players like Walker, Atkinson, Ristoline, and Lawton, and Sealer? Do you put them on the market but only pull the trigger if folks overpay? Now, Danny Breer was on the telecast before the game uh, against Colorado and said, you know, the way they're playing, where they are in the standings, it doesn't change anything. But what it does change, Bill, it may not change what they're doing, but what it does do is it changes his hand in negotiation, his element of leverage in a negotiation. And that is something that Chuck Fletcher perhaps mishandled was the leverage game. And all of a sudden, Danny breer has got a whole bucket of it of leverage on guys that are playing well to boot that other teams want. So how do you handle it? Well, I, I think, yeah, that's exactly right. Everything is dealing from a position of strength, yeah. right? Um, when you have what other teams want and you're, you're not just, uh, well, let's just take pennies on the dollar and just, you know, just cut bait here. All, all of a sudden the, the offers get way better. They get mm -hmm. way better. And and you have teams bidding against each each other too, um, you know. And you don't have to be an outright seller. Um, I, I I think that the Flyers are still, I don't want to say second in the division, but they're still in, in a playoff spot or right there. I do think there are considerations uh, of like, well, do we want? I'll just give an example. Do we do we want a middle round pick for Nick Sealer, or do we want Nick Sealer doing all the things he does? And if we lose them after the season, at the very least, we took our best shot the season. You know, is that is that worth more than a, a middle round pick? But if you have teams that are suddenly bidding against each other, and that middle middle round pick get, 
gets higher as to you know where where would have been otherwise if you're just out of it and you know, you're taking a, a fourth round pick or you know conditional third round pick, but the condition being you know a run to the Cup Finals kind of thing. I, I think I think your your options get a whole lot better. Um, I, if somebody comes and blows the Flyers away, uh, I think that they make the move. Yeah, you know. And they can so, justify it in the locker room. Yeah, and you can justify. It. Listen, guys, we're still we're still in a rebuild here. You know, we have we have good players on the way. We still have a good group here, and we're not we're not just tearing everything down. We're still there's still a process here. Um, I you know I I don't think they're going to go in any kind of fire sale mode, but I don't think we're going to do that anyway. But uh, you know, I I mean, I think that the Flyers still could be. I mean, and maybe you do, you know, maybe you do certain elements of your taking on for the rest of the year, a contract or a short term thing to make to make a long term play on it. Right. Where you're where you're getting maybe a better return out of something. And you know, the Flyers have so many options, so many ways they can go here. And I think that I think that's the big difference. And, and it was refreshing to hear Danny say that, you know, our, our overarching plan has not changed. And what that means is. The Flyers aren't going to, and and for a number of years they they overdid this, right? They traded too many second round picks in particular, and uh, and you know every once in a while at first, but but mostly it was it was second round kind of picks. You trade those assets, you you deplete your farm system, um, you overpay some guys, and all of a sudden you're, you're cab strapped. I mean all all the things that go with it. The Flyers had a situation for a while here where they had to rebuild the farm system. They were not in not in a good cap situation, and uh, you're not winning. So that that makes that makes dealing from a position almost impossible. And now the now they're in a much better situation. Wow, it, when you, you're right. They had the trifecta of the things you don't want to have. I mean, what else do you want to add to that? A tooth infection? I mean, <laughs> it's brutal. Uh, let's get to Ethan's question because it's along those lines. Ethan Freeman tweets in and says, "Are the Flyers finally getting some good luck?" Slash progress on prospect development he said between young players currently stepping up in the nhl york forster and brink prospects in other leagues lighting it up like barky and bonk it seems all we need is to stick with the new program and look they are getting you know a little bit better luck when it comes to knock on wood health you know uh, some of those guys obviously brink dealt with a health issue forster dealt with health issue with the shoulder uh and brink had the hip surgery uh, Barky and and Bonk are having very good starts to their season. We know Cutter Gauthier is having a, a, a great collegiate season, and we know what Michkov's done over with Sochi in the Continental Hockey League. Um, so, I, I mean, are they getting luck? Good luck, progress, and on that to front, uh, I don't know how you could argue against it. No, for sure, for sure. You know, I, to make your luck too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and listen, I mean, the Flyers. Um, it, it's hard to remember back there, right? But but in, in 2019, when the, the hockey news polled uh, the assistant general managers and scouting directors league wide, Flyers finished number one, pros- you know, in farm system depth. Um, you know, and, and a lot of guys like really came on in their draft plus one and draft plus two years, and then then guys fell by the wayside, and you had injuries, and you had this, and you had that, and and guys you were hopeful about didn't pan out or you know, or they took longer than you hoped or, or a variety of things. But the Flyers went from a, a vaunted farm system to it, it didn't really work out. They had, they had a lot of guys, you know, Isaac Radcliffe. Isaac Radcliffe had a, had a 50 goal year in his final junior year. And then another, another thing, 15 or 16 in the playoffs. Six, so a 64, 65 goal year. You know, I thought, okay, maybe it's going to take a little while as a power forward to develop. And Isaac, unfortunately, Raddy's a guy that it just kind of didn't ultimately work Fizzle. out with. Yeah. So I, I think you have to be I don't think you you know I don't think you take it too far in looking at what players are doing in, in the junior levels, you know. Um but you know, like for example, uh Denver Barkey. And he's he's had a tremendous year and he's a he's a fun hockey player to watch and I'm optimistic about him. But you know he's gonna have to add a lot of uh, physical maturity, right? Um, he's going to have to figure what, what's his role in the angel. Is, is he, you know, is he a top six? Is he a top nine? All, all those things remain to be seen, but certainly where the development has gone this year, um, 
kind of kind of up and down the draft. Even even some names that uh, don't get as much attention, like um, Zevragin, the Russian goalie, who's Wait, just um, not know. yeah. Not only is he tearing up the Russian junior league, he's playing in their equivalent of the the AHL, the V eight, the VHL is the minor league there, and he has a goals against of under one fifty in, in seven starts there. I mean, he's. And that's North a, a nine sixty save percentage too, by the way. That is correct. At age eighteen, in, <laughs> yeah. in their top minor league. I mean, yeah. that that kid is, uh, you know, is a tremendous prospect, and you don't even hear about him. Every flyer stuff, and that's something else too, right? Uh, positional depth in the farm system. The Flyers are going to have Flyers have more goalies in the farm system. They're going to be able to have in the NHL at some point. Yeah. But that's good because whenever you're dealing from strength, um, you can you know you can package guys in deals that help you fill needs. At higher levels, not not absolutely nothing wrong with depth, and that seems to be, you know, again, knock on wood, right? But that seems to be going in that direction. And that's that certainly is a positive. Yeah, it is big time. I mean, you look at, geez, you got Hart and Arison at the NHL level, Sandstrom. I know you still have Cal Peterson here, but you're looking at Kolasov and Bjarnason and. Uh, Zagre- I mean, and there's a, a lot of goalie depth there. Um, Paul tweets in, uh, Paul Lenzik, and says, if the Flyers are close to a playoff spot near the end of the year, do they sign Cutter Gauthier and waste a year of his contract? Um, I, I mean, I think of a player of his stature. I think that's almost a foregone conclusion that you do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's part of the deal, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's the price of Playing ball in, in today's yeah. NHL, so your your collegiate players, you Just don't you worry. No, you know you're gonna they'll play you know, five games or whatever it is at the end of the year, and you have to burn that year. That just is just part of the deal to get the, to get the kids signed. Yeah, uh, you know, but uh, you know, possibly because Boston College is, is a legitimate contender, you know, frozen for maybe even go all the way. You know, maybe maybe it works out that they they go all the way and it's late in the season and. You know, and maybe you end up with him next year. But I think most likely scenario is that uh, you know he'll he'll play a couple games in the NHL in April and, and you know, get going next year. Bill, uh, let's wrap up on this one, and this one comes from John Kincaid, of course, the morning show host on ninety seven five The Fanatic, was a hockey coach of mine way back in the late eighties, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, and uh, he tweets in this question, and this is a doozy. John X says the following. He said, what is the most sustainable thing you've seen from the Flyers so far? And what do you believe may be a mirage? Now, this is a hard. I could do a whole episode on this oh, question. Yeah. And I may. But, <laughs> um, Bill, when you think about it, what is the most sustainable thing? I mean, I think we all agree that effort is something that is controllable. Therefore, it should be sustainable. No, for sure, for sure, and, and something that goes hand in hand with that is when you have a, a a group that learns to play a certain way. Yeah, right. Flyers are playing faster; they're breaking out better. Um, you know, they they have defensemen that can less. move. Yeah, so and defending less. And once you have that identity and, and you know how to play that way, and even if if you get off of that game a little bit, you can get back to it. I think that's something that. Um, you can sustain with this group and then you, and then you can just, you know, build on going forward as you're adding more young talent to that. As you go forward, I think that's something you can, you can run with for a while. That to me is another big positive from the season. It's something you can build off of. Um, you know, I don't know if every year you're going to have a, you know, lead the league in shorthanded goals or, or it'd be up at the top of the, I mean, the Flyers are 40 for their last 42. That. That, that's not sustainable. No, nobody's going to do that for a whole year. Ridiculous, yeah. But um, you know, but to 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 have a, a strong penalty kill and to um, you know be able to get in other teams' heads and make them make them a, a little leery about going you know going laterally up high in the zone because you counter so well on them. Uh, those are things that um, once you have that identity and, and you're, you're settled in and you have your personnel and you know the guys that do it, I think you can run with that. So I think I think you can sustain a lot of that. Um, as far as unsustainable, I, I think we're in agreement that, you know, the, the amount of minutes Travis Sanheim is playing is something that yeah. is going to be worth keeping an eye on now. He's second in the NHL and average time on ice per game is played. He plays, he's played 25 minutes, an average of 25 minutes and 39 seconds, a whopping one second less 
than John Carlson of the Washington Capitals. Um, Travis Sanheim, though, when it comes to points per game, he's played. He's got 0.74 points per game played to Carlson's 0.63. And you, you look at uh, Drew Doughty, who's in third minutes played in the league, and he is at uh, 0.63 as well. So is that sustainable for Travis? And I think getting him off the penalty or the power play is the first step to managing yeah. his minutes a little bit and see kind of where it goes from there and what you can do with, you know, a third pair to maybe alleviate some of that pressure, at least in certain games. Yeah. I, I think building a reliable, a consistently reliable third pair is a big piece of that. Um, uh, on a similar front, I have, I've looked over the last 12 games. Uh, I was, Putting, pulling some stuff together, you know, when we were talking about what we we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, so I, I have over the over the last 12 games the Flyers have played, um, Konechny's averaging 19.58 of ice time. And Travis is still, you know, prime of his career. He's healthy. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to play 20 minutes a night as you get it down the stretch, but, you know, but I think Konechny can still handle it. I'm a little concerned about with Couturier because he's yeah. almost at 20 minutes a night too. 19, 1953 a game over the last 12 games. I, I worry about trying to sustain that. You'd um, rather see a 17 20 in there. That's the same here. Exactly. Yep. Uh, uh, Cam Atkinson over the, the last 12 games is north of 17 minutes a night. And he hasn't played his best hockey. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that'll get adjusted, you know, uh, as you move along. Um, one thing, one thing that it, that's been and and some of it's play related, some of it's just the games they've played. But you have um and even if you take out the game where Farabee, you know, played two shifts and sat the rest of the night, even if you toss that game out, his ice time is still down a couple minutes a night compared to where it was a year ago. Um Frost is down several minutes from where he was a year ago. Uh Tippett is down a little bit in ice time from where he was this time a year ago. I think as you're moving forward. Those guys, some of those guys who, you know, we came in this year saying, okay, those guys need to take the next step. I think that still is the case with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd like to see their roles increase again. Um, again, maybe, maybe in a game like Colorado where you really you need the Konechny's and the uh, Katori's really leading the way for you. It may not be the case every game. But I'd like to see some of those guys playing a little more and just managing Katori's minutes in particular – because coming off of two back surgeries, that that's you know, that's serious business. I mean, right now he looks great. Yep. And right now he's holding up really well. But I want him to hold up for the whole season. So that's something that, that concerns me a little bit. Yeah, I think balancing your top nine forward minutes a little bit more is paramount. Like Faraby, I mean, every one of his goals, I mean, eight of his 10 goals, Bill, he has scored within two and a half feet of the goal line. Yes. I mean, he's always yeah. there. And, and that's just, to me, that's so indicative of a guy that's healthy. Uh, willing to go there because that that real estate's not easy land. That's not Disneyland there. That's a tough place to make a living. And he just keeps going. There. And I'll tell you, this brink and tight, the, the pass he makes on that play, you know, Sanheim oh. brings it in, go, yeah. goes power to the net. And then Brink just, there is just no panic to his game at all. And, you know, just the way Bobby Brink's skating stride still looks a little, I don't know, different, goofy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, not aesthetically pleasing, but he, he gets there every, at, at every turn. He's always in the right spot. No, for sure. And, you know, his forechecking game has grown, too. Oh, yeah. um, the, on, on that Sandheim goal in Colorado, uh, he didn't get a point off of it, but the forechecking work that Brink turned in on that whole sequence, yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't score that goal without yeah. that. And, and um, yeah, I mean, just, just his ability to find the open man. I mean, he's, he, he's a dynamic, dynamic distributor. So that's uh, that's something too that uh, you know. Of course, there aren't uh, there aren't ice times to compare it to because he's a rookie. But I, I'd like to see you know. I know Torch has said he wants to see his checking game uh, off off puck grow a little bit better defensively. But I think maybe before he gives him more responsibility. But I, I'm confident he'll get there. You know, yeah. I, I think that um, I think he's been. Another another guy who's been a positive this year. So I think there's there's room to grow for these guys, um, you know. And, and other other guys, I think there's room to see a little bit of what we saw in the second half last year. I'm hoping I'm hoping those guys get there. Yeah, I, and I think you know one of the things that we're wondering if it's sustainable is the goaltending. Yeah, and a lot of that will be predicated on the D, and the D will be predicated on the goaltending. So those two 
will go hand in hand to some degree. I think that Bobby Brink was a good player at hot potato. You know, he was never one of those guys that got rid of it right away. He'll hang yeah. on to the hot, hot potato, hot potato. You know, <laughs> that whole thing. I didn't think I'd be doing the wiggles in this episode. But there you go. Uh, great stuff, Bill. Great questions from everybody. We'll revisit some of them uh, that we didn't get to throughout the week as the Flyers uh, with yet another uh, busy and very important week of hockey. Uh, they'll wrap up the road trip against Nashville on Tuesday. Then they'll head uh, back home to take on Washington Thursday, Detroit Saturday, before Bill and I reconvene a week from today. Read Bill's work at NHL.com, PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, and HockeyBuzz.com, and we'll talk to you tomorrow when we preview Flyers Nashville Predators on a brand-new Flyers Daily.